it's really exciting to be here and talk about uh, this book, American Islamophobia, which uh, was released roughly about a month and a half ago that I began formally writing roughly a year ago, but in fact have been writing for the duration of much of my life. Um, uh, before I was a law scholar, before I was an activist or an advocate, I was a Muslim American who, you know, obviously faced the perils of discrimination in this country, the war on terror, uh, the demonization of Islam and of Muslims before the war on terror, and before we came, you know, come to know this term that we all are familiar with today called Islamophobia. So I, I want to treat today's lecture as an opportunity uh, to not only share the book and, you know, share pieces of the book, I want to share and read excerpts of the book, uh, but my, primarily, my primary mission and takeaway for the evening is to make sure that everybody walks away tonight, everybody leaves this evening with a comprehensive, robust, and thorough understanding of what Islamophobia is. That's the takeaway, that's the objective. I'm a teacher, so my, my primary mission behind writing this book and tonight's talk is to teach. So what I want to do in uh, highlighting this book and discussing this book is to focus on three primary themes. Three primary themes, and the first is, which is um, the theoretical foundation of the book, is to introduce my, my definition of what Islamophobia is and what Islamophobia means. You'll see that my definition veers away from prevailing conceptions of Islamophobia, which I find to be far too narrow, far too flat, and far too one-dimensional. Second, the second objective behind this talk is to contend that Islamophobia is an emanation of white supremacy, right? is an emanation of a system, a specific racial project that not only intends to dehumanize Muslims and to construct Islam as this violent, violent monolith, but also tie it to other forms of oppression and other systems of oppression and dehumanization that we are familiar with, but generally tend not to tie and tether to Islamophobia. Third, what I want to do is to highlight the idea that Islamophobia is intersectional. We all know this term, intersectionality, coined by my mentor, Kimberly Crenshaw. It's achieved a lot of prominence, a lot of resonance in the last couple of years with the success, with the trenchance of the Black Lives Matter movement which facilitated, in my opinion, much of the advocacy against Islamophobia during the rise of Trump. Clearly, we know that the Black Lives Matter movement intersected with and converged with the rise of white supremacist populism as spearheaded by Trump. So I want to bring those two worlds together to effectively demonstrate two things. First, that Muslim America is by no means a homogenous monolith comprised of foreign immigrant Arab or Middle Eastern, but in fact is a rich and supremely diverse heterogeneous community, and second to demonstrate that Islamophobia victimizes and inflicts injury on Muslim Americans who are diverse in a distinct and diverse myriad of ways. Those are the three objectives. Please walk with me during the talk. I'm really excited about an exchange with all of you today, so please, if you have any questions, comments, um, any insight you have, uh, after my presentation, I'm excited to have that exchange with you, so please do speak up and share your viewpoints. I want to lead with this quote. Now, by a show of hands, who knows who Edward Said is? Great, a lot of people. Edward Said is very instrumental to the work that I do and very instrumental to understanding what Islamophobia is, and I'll get into that really shortly when I discuss this system, this discourse called Orientalism, which I frame as the foundation, as the precedent system that gives rise to modern Islamophobia. But before I do that and get into that boring theoretical stuff, I want to share this quote that I read when I was 18 years old uh, from Edward Said's autobiography titled, Out of Place. I am an Oriental writing back at the Orientalists who for so long have thrived upon our silence. Now, I'll do some personalizing because the book actually has some autobiographical dimensions to it, but I was a horrible high school student. I was a troublemaker, flunked freshman year of high school, really felt, you know, kind of alienated from the formal public school system. You know, the books I was reading at school, the textbooks that I was, you know, reading weren't resonating with me. They weren't really aligning with the world uh, that surrounded me living on the west side of Detroit. However, 
When I picked up Edward Said's autobiography out of place and I read these words, I finally had an idea of what it is I wanted to do with my life. Because one thing you're immediately conscious of as a Muslim American living in this country is those individuals speaking on your behalf in books, on television, and in film never look like us. They don't practice our faith, right? They are largely individuals who are vested in demonizing and distorting the religion. So it wasn't until I read the words of Edward Said that I knew that I wanted to dedicate my life to not only dismantling what I didn't know what yet was called Islamophobia, but dismantling this system, this well-embedded system that vilified people that believed like me and people that looked like me. So that's when I realized that really early on that I wanted to write a book. The second reason why I wanted to write a book is true, I'm, I am a scholar, true, I am a law professor who closely examines the war on terror, the First Amendment, and what we all know now is Islamophobia. But before all of that, I was a Muslim. I come from a Muslim family, a single parent Muslim household, where I closely felt in very direct ways how Islamophobia can cripple, handicap, and mar people that I love, my sister, my mother, who's worn the hijab since a young age, and so on and so forth. So this book is far more than just a theoretical project. This book is far more than just an academic project. This book is also a personal project which finally takes a stand in front of Orientalists and Islamophobes to say, you've spoken on our behalf for too long, it's time for us to speak on our own terms and from our perspective. So I say that now I want to transition on and focus in on how I define Islamophobia. Roughly two years ago with the rise of Trump, um, I was getting a lot of interest from publishing houses asking me, Professor Beydoun, would you mind writing a popular book on Islamophobia, getting requests from media outlets, from the conservative side all the way to the liberal side. Professor Beydoun, how do you feel about the travel ban? How do you feel about what Trump's doing and saying and so on? And one thing I quickly realized, two things. The first thing was, it was heartening that mainstream spaces were finally concerned and interested with addressing Islamophobia. The optimistic thing was that Islamophobia was finally rising and emerging to be a mainstream civil rights slash social justice issue. And that wasn't the case after 9-11, let me tell you. I, I'm, I'm, old, I'm a lot older than I might look, but I can tell you after 9-11, there wasn't a lot of interest in Muslim American civil rights and civil liberties issues. It was still very much a fringe and a marginal issue. But juxtaposed with that progressive sort of step where Islamophobia was emerging into a mainstream social justice issue, was that it was still being defined in very narrow and flat ways, right? It was largely being defined as a form of animus, bigotry, or violence that was inflicted by private individuals, right? Private actors that the media, scholars, ca presidential candidates on the left were deeming as, you know, kind of deviant actors. These weren't individuals that were emblematic of society. These weren't individuals that were in any way related to what the state was doing, right? Private Islamophobia is what I came to define it. And, you know, frustrated with that definition, I step back like, you know, every good academic does. And instead of complaining, try to offer some sort of solution, right? Some sort of prescription that gave sense to what Islamophobia, you know, means in a more comprehensive and broad way. So I defined Islamophobia, the foundational definition, as the presumption that Islam is inherently violent, alien, and inassimilable, driven by the belief that expressions of Muslim identity are correlative with a propensity for terrorism. That is the foundational definition. However, beyond that foundational definition, I break it down into three forms. First, private Islamophobia. Second, which I just briefly defined, and I'll get back to defining it more broadly, and more closely. Second, we have structural Islamophobia. And then finally, third, it's critical to understand Islamophobia as it propagates itself, as it uh, metastasizes, as a dialectic. It's a communication that ties what the state is doing to what's taking place on the ground with private actors. There's a direct correlation 
to where state activity, state policy actually endorses and emboldens what we understand as private Islamophobia. And I'll define those three forms more closely in a bit. Um, but as I mentioned earlier on, we can't talk about Islamophobia unless we talk about Orientalism. Right? Orientalism is this master discourse, this theory framed again by this prominent uh, uh, intellectual Palestinian intellectual by the name of Edward Said, whose quote I read earlier, really prominent within academic spaces, but it also had deep impact beyond the academic spaces within political conversations, within societal discourses, and so forth and so on. I'm going to briefly define what Orientalism is for those of you who don't know. But what Orientalism is, is a master discourse that originally arises from Europe, whereby kings and queens, novelists, scholars, artists, tastemakers, anybody with influence, anybody that was effectively a societal gatekeeper, came to define the West, initially Europe and then the United States, in mirror opposite terms of the Orient, right? And the Orient here is synonymous with the Muslim world. So if the West is where progressivism, liberalism, democracy thrived, then the Muslim world had to be barren, backwards, and static. If the West was where forward thinking, industry, and innovation was pervasive, then the Muslim world had to be backwards. It had to be intellectually devoid, and it had to be averse to any kind of advancement. And this narrative became far more than just theory or epistemology. It became legally embraced in the United States. Orientalism was, in fact, a system that was embraced and, and parroted and adopted by, by the framers of this country and also by Supreme Court justices. And I'll read a quote more closely from the Supreme Court where we see specific embrace of Orientalism. So again, Really key, a primary takeaway I want you guys all to walk home with today is Islamophobia is by no means a new and a novel phenomenon. It rises from the roots of this system called Orientalism, which has lived for centuries, which has been legally embedded by courts, and also enshrined in law, like I'll discuss more closely in a bit. And again, we have private Islamophobia, which I mentioned seconds, seconds ago being the first dimension that we're all familiar with. And what private Islamophobia is, is fear, suspicion, and violent targeting of Muslims by individuals or private actors. And we see private Islamophobia manifest itself in very vivid ways, especially since the rise of Trump and even years before in the aftermath of the 9-11 terror attacks. We see it, obviously, with this uptick in vandalizations and arsons on masajid or mosques. We see it on the attack and violence being unleashed against vivid or conspicuous Muslims and sometimes non-Muslims, right? Because private Islamophobia is generally driven by this imagined caricature of who Muslims are. Sikh men are oftentimes the primary victims of Islamophobia, and I talk about that really closely in the book. And we see it most tragically in the murder of three University of North Carolina Chapel Hill students in February of 2015, whose photos are depicted here on the slide killed by a man named Craig Hicks because of how these people uh, decided to dress and decided to worship. So Islamophobia is private in nature, but it's also structural, and it's key to identify how its structural prowess and its structural origins. In this sense, we can analogize Islamophobia to how we understand racism, right? We have individual racism, but we also have institutional or structural racism, and that is also true for Islamophobia. The fear and suspicion of Muslims on the part of institutions, most notably government age agencies manifested through the enactment and advancement of law, policy, government policing, and formal governmental rhetoric. And we see structural Islamophobia in all of its glory, or maybe not its glory, but its infamy, right, through policies like the Patriot Act, the National Security Entry and Exit Registration System, which for the lawyers in the room know that was the Muslim registry before Trump calls his proposal, the Muslim registry, see something, say something, community surveillance in mosques, counter-radicalization policing, the travel bans, all three of them, structural Islamophobia. And what's key about structural Islamophobia is that it pervades every single governmental or presidential administration since the rise 
of the war on terror. So one thing to be very mindful of, and I, for those of you who know my work and follow it closely, you'll know that I wrote an op-ed this past week in The Guardian identifying the rise of liberal Islamophobia or progressive Islamophobia. It's, it's important to know that Islamophobia, and it's key not to caricature Islamophobia as something exclusively rising from the right. I think the media conversation, the media discourse likes to pigeonhole Islamophobia as something specifically coming from the right. But this slide identifies that it's a system, it's a project that is advanced and committed to by both the, the left and the right. We see that through this slide. Obviously, the Bush administration establishes the war on terror and the modern rise of structural Islamophobia. But under the Obama administration, we have the establishment of what, what I consider, what I deem to be the most destructive and pernicious form of structural Islamophobia called counter-radicalization policing. And before I close this lecture, I'm going to read a section of the book which, inshallah, which hopefully, you know, gives you a, a really intimate glimpse into how counter-radicalization policing functions on the ground in the heart of Muslim American communities. During the third phase of the war on terror, we see Islamophobia perhaps in the most explicit and brazen form with the rise of Trump. And the Trump moment makes Islamophobia a cognizable system or, or, or form of bigotry that we have to fight against. But again, we can see through the slide, and once we frame Islamophobia as being structural, that it is anything but new. And finally, third, and what I consider to be the cornerstone of my definition, is that it's key to understand Islamophobia as a dialectic. As a dialectic. As a critical race theorist, what I teach my students is that racism is a dynamic system. It's fluid. It's contingent upon prevailing political, economic, social stimuli, prevailing interests, and so on, which we can see racism mutating gradually and consistently in line with those shifting interests. That's also true for Islamophobia. It's never static. It's always shifting depending on who's presiding over the governmental administration and what political powers are effectively presiding over power at any given moment. So it's a dialectic. In this conversation or communication that perpetuates Islamophobia is, eventually, is essentially carried forward by law. If law and policy, as I just highlighted in the previous slide, is built upon this baseline which ties manifestations of Muslim identity to the prospect or presumption of terrorism, then law is just more than guidelines or dictates that exist on paper. Law is also ideas. Ideas that are filtered and disseminated through policy, through governmental officials, uh, through publications and so forth and so on. So the law is actually instructing the citizenry to partake in this project of policing, punishing, and persecuting Muslims, which is why during moments of crisis, and moments of crisis might be when a nominal Muslim commits a terror attack, or even a non-Muslim actor like Timothy McVeigh commits a terror attack, the scapegoats or the primary, uh, you know, I guess, thought to be culprits of the attack are typically Muslims. So what happens during these moments of crisis is hate incidents and hate crimes rise. And that is no coincidence. That is no coincidence at all because with the expansion of structural Islamophobic policy, right, with the expansion of official governmental rhetoric demonizing and blaming Muslims, Again, it's a dictate authorizing, moving, and mobilizing people on the ground to engage in vigilante violence against individuals they perceive to be Muslims or, in fact, bona fide Muslims. So those are the three components of Islamophobia that comprise the system, that comprise the project as we know it today. Next, it's critical to understand that Islamophobia rises from this system of white supremacy that undergirds American society, the economic system, and the political discourse at large. And in the book, I articulate really closely the origins of how Islamophobia is effectively spurred and carried forward by white supremacy. But what I want to do here today is to highlight two examples, two vivid examples, 
of how this project of Islamophobia is in fact closely tied in the interests of white supremacy push it forward. First is, there was this era called the naturalization era. Many of you might know what it is. Um, I can tell you I was floored when I learned about this when I was a second year law student at UCLA. Um, I remember sitting in that class. Uh, it was an immigration law class, actually. I thought that I wanted to be an immigration attorney when I was young. Um, and the first, one of the first things I read was this law called the Naturalization Act of 1790. Right? In this act that was enacted roughly three years after uh, the Bill of Rights were implemented, uh, the Constitution was drafted, mandated whiteness as a prerequisite for, for naturalized citizenship. You had to be white to become a naturalized citizen in this country from 1790 all the way up to 1952. For 162 years of this country's history, whiteness stood as a full-fledged mandate for naturalized citizenship. I was floored by that. Didn't think you know, something that explicit, that brazen, could be enshrined by American law. Now that I learned more about American law, it shouldn't have come to you know, as great a surprise that it did when I was a 22-year-old law student back in those, uh, back in those days. I, you know, I guess I was wide-eyed, naive, and dumb, maybe. Um, but one thing I, I quickly learned after understanding how Muslim identity was racialized, and again, back to the system of Orientalism, is that Muslim identity was understood to be far more than just a religious identity by the framers, by uh, the founders of the country, and clearly by the legal gatekeepers, including judges and justices behind the bench. Orientalism had effectively constructed Muslim identity into far more than just a religious identity, but a racial identity, a civilizational identity, and something that was thought to be and constructed to be averse, inimical, and inassimilable with American identity. So as a consequence of this framing, um, you had judges, much like this judge, Judge Stephen Field, a justice on the Supreme Court, say the intense hostility of the people of Muslim faith, you didn't say Muslim faith, you said Muslim faith, sometimes they said Mohammedan too, uh, to all other sects, and particularly to Christians, affected all of their intercourse. So as a consequence, and this, this was not a unique perspective, this was not a sort of aberrant position held by one justice on the bench, this was definitely popular and pervasive attitude held by almost every judge, not every, but a majority of judge, judges and justices behind the bench. As a consequence of this racialization of Muslims as being this foreign, inassimilable, kind of, you know, fifth pillar uh, people, they could not become naturalized. They could not, they weren't deemed to be white and to fit within the statutory of definition of whiteness. So as a consequence of this, Muslim immigrants from a range of places from across the world tried to come to the United States and were denied citizenship and either did not come to the country at all because they knew that their faith preempted the prospect of them, be, them becoming citizens or lived in hiding or effectively you know, converted for superficial reasons so they could become naturalized citizens. But in conjunction with this prohibition of Muslims, which I call the, the Muslim ban before we come to understand what Trump's proposal called the Muslim ban was. This was, in fact, the first Muslim ban that presided for roughly 162 years. There were Muslims on this soil. There were Muslims living in the United States as enslaved Africans in the antebellum South. In the book, I talk about how 15 to 30 percent of the enslaved African population being bonded to plantations, working on tobacco fields, picking cotton, being wed and bonded to the most inhuman conditions, continued to practice their faith in resistance to slave code and a slave master. However, the white supremacist racial taxonomy being constructed in this country erased and unsaw them as legitimate Muslims because blackness was a construction and a classification that was reduced to signify property and property alone. And property could not practice faith. Property could not practice Islam. So you had the simultaneous erasure 
of the pioneer Muslim communities living here stateside, coexisting with the exclusion of Muslim immigrants being denied naturalized citizenship on account of the religious identity. So the travel ban, the Muslim ban, ain't nothing new. It's been practiced and enacted and implemented for centuries in this country. And when we see the language of Justice Field, I'm not going to dignify and call him a justice. I'm going to call him Field. Uh, <laughs> field here, not much unlike the rhetoric of Trump, who I'm not going to dignify and call president. Might be your president, but not mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Tr Trump also engages in the same monolithic construction of Islam and demonization of Muslims. So we see that this rhetoric that Trump engages in, and even before Trump, that the Tea Party was peddling, does not rise from a vacuum. It doesn't come from left field. It's deeply embedded in the American imagination, has been endorsed by judges, justice, framers, and founders who came far before the orange-skinned uh, culprit here before us. So <laughs> white supremacy, again, um, gave rise to Islamophobia. And again, it's really critical that we tie the two together. And again, we could see, in the modern sense, how the new travel ban carries forward the objectives of white supremacy. This is the original ban here before us with the seven original states, all Muslim majority. Supreme Court heard arguments for the third rendition of the travel ban roughly a month ago. And you know my unfortunately pessimistic forecast is that I think the Supreme Court will uphold the travel ban. But we can see the objective of what the travel ban is. It's an intentional, vivid way to exclude Muslims from coming into the country to further the objective of maintaining the white integrity of this country that Trump calls make America great again, which is a not all too, I guess, clandestine dog whistle. It seems like it's explicit sort of language seeking to restore and hearken the white supremacist um, history of the United States. So white supremacy, again, is a foundation of Islamophobia, and it's key to, it's key to understand it that way. Third, Islamophobia at the intersections, again, Pivotal to understand what intersectionality is. Again, a term that has risen to extreme popular prominence. It's being echoed by activists on the ground. My 13-year-old niece thinks she knows what it means. Young people are holding it up on signs across the country, peering on social media statuses and posts, which is really heartening because it's complicating how we understand racism, bigotry, sexism, homophobia, all of these ugly and destructive, destructive things are experienced by specific individuals. And sometimes this bigotry is experienced distinctly depending on who that individual is, how that individual looks like, how that individual chooses to live her or his life, and where that person lives. And another reason I decided to write this book, I, I was really frustrated with how you know, many scholars, both progressive and conservative, we're sort of framing Muslim Americans as victims on one hand, as being this you know, similar, similarly situated block of people that were enduring and experiencing Islamophobia in the same way. Right? On the right, you had a demonization of Muslims as being the sort of united, caricature block of people. On the left, you had um, generally non-Muslims illustrating Muslims as being victims who were experiencing Islamophobia in, the, in a similar fashion, which I think, you know, illustrates a different kind of Orientalism or Islamophobia, you know, highlighting the distance and the dissonance even many progressives and liberals have when they try to address and cover perils being faced within Muslim American communities. So Islamophobia, and in the book I have a score of vignettes that highlight how Islamophobia is experienced distinctly along gender lines. We know that for Muslim sisters who wear the hijab, they are oftentimes the primary victims of Islamophobia because of how they look, because, because of how they manifest their faith. So gender is critical to understanding how private Islamophobia is inflicted. It's also critical to understand how structural Islamophobia functions because the state is typically concerned with a masculine form of imagined Muslim threat with programs like counter-radicalization, the homegrown radical 
is generally imagined by the state to be a young Muslim male. So gender is central to understanding how Islamophobia is inflicted and experienced. Next, poverty in class. Again, um, something that's really dear to me is that, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a working class Muslim community. Many people tend to think that Muslim America is this upwardly mobile, comfortably middle class. You know, I, I hate seeing this one stat. Every time they want to normalize Muslims on social media, they'll tell you that 10% of Muslims are doctors. I hate seeing that stat, man. Uh, because it's kind of like this like respectability politics. You got to like us because if you don't like us, we might not give you good service when you come to the hospital, right? So it's kind of like caricaturing Muslims as being, you know, this, you know, safely, uh, you know, I guess professional, uh, wealthy, and affluent class, which isn't the case, right? A segment of Muslim America is upwardly mobile, professional, and wealthy. But fixating on that segment is to the detriment of seeing that a considerable segment of Muslim America is poor and existing at the legal, legal poverty line. 44% of black Muslim households are just above, at, or below the legal poverty line. 37% of Arab Muslim households are just above, at, or below the legal poverty line. And this is not a statistic that I'm sharing to kind of highlight the perils of conventional poverty. When we talk about poverty in the Muslim American community, it's critical to intersect it with what's happening with the war on terror. That poor and working class Muslim communities are oftentimes not only the most vulnerable communities to structural Islamophobic policy, but in fact specifically targeted communities by structural Islamophobic policy. So before I close the talk, I want to read this excerpt from the book that examines and kind of hones in on the intersection of poverty, race, and the war on terror more closely, and then we can segue into the Q&A. I don't know I feel turned up. I, I, maybe uh, I was fasting and had some coffee before. It's Ramadan, by the way, so Ramadan Mubarak to those of you observing the holy month. Thank you, brother. Ahmed was born in Little Mogadishu two years after his parents settled in Minnesota, building community with other Somalis seeking refuge in the heart of the American Midwest. It is the only home he has ever known. Today, Ahmed studies biology at a nearby college, regularly attends a local mosque, and in line with his parents' request, sends some of the money he earns from his part-time job to his family members in Somalia. He also helps his parents, who live on a modest income, supplemented by federal assistance and food stamps, pay their rent each month. A diehard Minnesota Timberwolves and Vikings fan, Ahmed's social media timelines are flooded with posts about the team's latest victories and losses, and from time to time, status updates about political and economic tumult in Somalia, a nation that he has never visited, but like many first-generation Somali Americans living in the city, has a strong affinity for. The year 2014 marked a critical turning point for Ahmed. During the holy month of Ramadan, while Muslims are obliged to abstain from food and water from sunrise to sundown, Ahmed found himself spending more time in the mosque. He would make the short walk over when he found time between classes and his work shifts, and he became a fixture at the mosque in the early morning when brothers and sisters convened uh, to make tarawih. Uh, the special Ramadan prayers. Like many young people of faith, whether Christian or Jew, Hindu or Buddhist, Ahmed was drawn to Islam at the crossroads of his teenage and adult years. Smitten by the beauty of the Quran, he finally picked up to read closely and drawn in by the tight-knit community that surrounded him. Ramadan drew him closer to Islam and closer to the community, and he found himself drawn to maintaining a more pious lifestyle beyond the holy month. Faith changed Ahmed from the inside, and gradually, his enhanced spirituality would become more manifest on the outside. Ahmed always knew that Islam, always knew Islam, and was always around the mosque. But months before his 19th birthday, he finally embraced, he fully embraced it as a, as a way of life. At the end of Ramadan in 2014, Ahmed kept a beard to signify his piety. He skipped spending weekend nights with friends at downtown clubs in favor of evenings discussing politics, community concerns, and faith at the Somali Starbucks on Riverside Avenue. His Facebook statuses began to reflect the spiritual growth and personal maturity Ahmed was experiencing, and in line with developing a stronger social justice bent, 
He began forming critical opinions of American foreign policy and domestic counterterror policy. Quotes from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, and other important Islamic figures filled his Facebook page, while pictures of grand mosques in the Middle East, Africa, and beyond were, were the snapshots he featured on his Instagram account instead of selfies or pictures of his dream cars. Everybody around him noticed his shift for the better, particularly his family and closest friends. Apart from spiritual growth, Ahmed's academic performance dramatically improved, his professional drive and sense of pr purpose sharpened, and his commitment to social justice and community philanthropy strengthened. But this personal advancement, which would seem benign for young men of other faiths, spelled danger for Ahmed, a Muslim and a black man, he occupied perhaps the most dangerous intersection of identity during the American moment in which he lived, a period of radical reform on the national security policing front. He was now deemed a homegrown radical by the state, and homegrown radicalization policing converged upon his home. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Seattle, Khaled. Thank you. I have an issue which you didn't address directly, sure. uh, but it's been very important to me. Uh, and I'll just have a short explanation before the question. Okay. Shortly after 9-11, an Islamic friend of mine who was a spokesman for Islam in Seattle and appeared on Channel 9 on behalf of Seattle for discussions, told me this, all Muslims, and he repeated, all Muslims are taught that Islam is the final perfection of religion. Therefore, all people must convert to Islam or be killed. This statement has also been made by Mahersi Ali in her latest book. My question is this, how will people who have not been converted react to this other than to be Islamophobic? Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that question. Um, so, I'm not a religious scholar, so I'm going I'm to preface my response with that. But, I, but I'll tell you that your friend or your former friend's contention that everybody must, must be converted or die, I think that was his quote, is false. It's wrong, and he's doing what I would classify as a vile distortion uh, of my reading of uh, Islamic scripture, the Quran, the Hadith, uh, in, 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 supplementary, uh, in supplementary sources. So I would reject what he said. I think that's a very simplistic uh, you know, characterization and a vile characterization of the holy book. Uh, and second, I would not look at Ayan Hirsi Ali as any kind of expert or any kind of you know, authentic sort of voice on what Islam is or isn't. And the reason I say that is because I would classify and have written about how Ayan Hirsi Ali is in fact a native informant. She's somebody who was a mercenary for hire who was being paid a considerable amount of money to peddle and to parrot really destructive ideas and messages about Islam. Really great book, and I'm bringing this book up um, because I just read it a week ago um, by uh, Edward Said. It's called Representations of the Intellectual. I highly recommend people read that book. And Said talks about how uh, it, it's, a, it's critical to sort of distinguish intellectuals from um, individuals who are hired by political institutions with interests to advance a, sp a specific set of objectives. Ayan Hirsi Ali is not an intellectual. She's effectively a hired gun, again, enlisted by a range of problematic think tanks, um, right-wing chops, Islamophobic institutions, to propagate these misnomers and, again, vile misrepresentations of what Islam is. So I, I would highly caution anybody to view her, to view Majid Nawaz, to view Sam Harris, Bernard Lewis, who passed away last week, uh, any of these individuals who are effectively given carte blanche to write for the New York Times anytime they want as being authentic voices of what Islam is or isn't. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, so racist that when Muslims come over here, they, they're surprised that 
they're so surprised by what they get. You know? Yeah. That's, you know, the foundation of America is good at this. Yep. You know, and I would say to anybody, go learn about something. Don't just go by what you see or what you say. Because if you saw pictures of the Ku Klux Klan in this country, they said they were Christian, and that's all you would think. You would think they're white people are, are hate mongers. Go learn about Islam. If you have a question, go to a master. But I can tell you in the Quran, there is no compulsion in Islam. And it says, you're free to worship you, you're free to worship you. Mm -hmm. It says that in the Quran. It says, if you kill an innocent person, it's like killing all the men. If you say that exactly. you like person, it's like saving all of humanity. All right? Yeah. So I would say, get to know people, and they never talk about when we're down on, 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 down on Yesler, as long as council look, when we're feeding the homeless and we're giving them uh, food packs and things, or when we're there thinking on Veterans Day, feeding the veterans and home, we do that every year. Mm -hmm. So I would say, this organization right here, go look at this organization right here. Mm -hmm. We're not terrorists. If you can, if you're going to get rid of Muslims, you're going to get rid of doctors, engineers. I work for both. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. All right? I was born in this country. Mm -hmm. All right? I work, I do everything. I do this. I always have 30 years of going All right? So you can get rid of a whole lot of people who are the moral fabric of this country. Thanks very much for that. I, I think that in, in a critical point, two points that the brother brought up. First, there is no compulsion in Islam, which goes to your question that um, Muslims are instructed not to compel or force any individual to adopt Islam or any other faith. And second, um, you know, again, any harm or violence inflicted on one individual, uh, Muslims believe, is effectively a crime committed against all of humanity. So I, I really appreciate you, brother, for bringing up those two points, helping me respond to the first gentleman's question <laughs> earlier on. Um, I am a doctoral student, a doctoral candidate at the University of Washington, and I also work with a lot of um, refugees and immigrants with the International Rescue Committee. Mm -hmm. And I'm a naturalized Arab Muslim citizen. And one of the things that I see with a lot of my clients is um, a certain element of internalized uh, Islamophobia, and that was something that um, I get really excited when you're throwing out theoretical and dialectical, I'm like, yes, I'm such a nerd. But I was wondering where in the internalized Islamophobia would yeah. fit in um, in your structure, and if you could speak a little bit to that, and then how, if you have any ideas around how to um, speak with especially new clients. Um, I was working with a client today who gets assigned a birth date because he's mm -hmm. from Afghanistan and didn't have one necessarily, and the assigned birth dates are often September 11th. I don't know if that's somebody's mm -hmm. stupid joke, but that's what I see. Yeah. And I, that, I think that's leading to a certain degree of internalized fear and concern. Yeah. That makes sense. No, it does. Yeah, so w with the question with regard to, uh, you know, internalized Islamophobia, I'll address that really briefly. So the, 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 book, the book's foundational definition enables, you, you know, grappling with, I guess, auxiliary forms of Islamophobia as experienced by individuals. I think that fits largely within, uh, you know, private Islamophobia because these are, these are private actors. And, you know, one thing that I didn't mention, and I'm really appreciative you brought it up, is that Muslims can be Islamophobic. Muslims can be Islamophobic by way of effectively embracing and adopting anti-Muslim ideas, either by way of self-loathing or internalized Islamophobia. And we see this through a myriad of ways, right? We see this typically, for instance, maybe manifested through aspirational whiteness, individuals choosing not to express their Muslim identities because they're trying to assimilate or be broadly accepted, or for um, you know Muslim populations that phenotypically might be able to pass as white, you have the process where anti uh, or, or internalized Islamophobia might also mesh with internalized anti-Arab sentiment or South Asian sentiment. Sentiment. But I also want to raise the point about how Islamophobia is propagated by Muslims in a more complex, I guess, institutional way. There's a cottage industry of Muslims who I qualify as native informants who are wed, right? They're actually assuming roles and tasks in society that are advancing Islamophobia, right? Again, Ayan Hirsi Ali is a classic example. You also have other individuals now rising from the left 
um, who are proponents of counter-radicalization policing and so on. Uh, there's a program called the Muslim Leadership Initiative, and I'm not going to mention names, but specific individuals that are normalizing um, Zionism abroad and oppression abroad by effectively deploying their Muslim identity to legitimize those activities. So Muslims are, have, have historically and still today performing roles that justify and normalize uh, Islamophobia in, on the domestic front, but also on the, on the foreign policy front. Hi. How are you? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, it was basically to springboard off of this gentleman's question. So uh, I do personally believe that Islam is inherently violent. Uh, have you read the Quran? Yes, I'm reading it for the third time right now, and I'm even okay. memorizing some verses. So this is the Reliance of the Traveler. I've read all 1115 pages. Mm -hmm. 09.8 says, the Caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, provided he has first invited them to enter Islam in faith and practice, and if they will not, then invited them to enter the social order of Islam by paying the non-Muslim poll tax, jizya. Mm -hmm. And the war continues until they become Muslim or else pay the non-Muslim poll tax in accordance with the word of Allah most high. So this is also a springboard from Surah 929, which says, fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger Muhammad. And those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, that is Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So I understand that there is compulsion in religion. Okay, okay so are you, are you, would you classify yourself as a textualist or somebody who interprets text really closely or somebody who believes in a living document or constitution? I'm a Christian. I, okay, uh, no, but, that, but, that, but answer the question specifically. Yeah, I, I read the Quran and I study it very so you, closely. So you, you read things really textually then? Uh, According I, to your reading of the Quran just right now, you seem like a textualist. Now, do you read the Bible and the Talmud and the Torah with the same textualist approach that you just did the Quran? Uh, I read it all in context. That's my That's approach, not answering too. my question. It seems like you're a textualist, so it seems that... I, I'm not if, sure what a textualist is. Well, you is. should know what that is if you're looking to have, you know, kind of a legal conversation on what Islam is or isn't, right? That's a that's a, that's Well, a I just have to step. read it in context, read the scholars, even Kathir on QTFSir.com. So, so again, I can... Look, if you're taking a textual approach to reading any body of law, whether religious, religious or secular... You, you, should, you can read and, and pluck out that same sort of language from the Talmud, the Torah, the Bible, any, any religious book or doctrine, right? Now, one thing I want you to be mindful of when you leave today is that Islamic jurisprudence is really broad. There's a range of what are called schools of thought, right? Yes, there, this is one of the four schools of thought. No, it isn't one of the schools of thought. Sure it is. Which when one it's is it? 75, it's the Shafi school of jurisprudence. Okay, which is, which is one of the four Sunni schools of thought, but there are additional Shafi. schools of... There's a range of schools of thought. So, you know, again... That's you know, the Hadith. Sahih Bukhari is a Hadith. Yes. Let me, let me, I mean, We're not talking you, about that. You asked, you asked the question, right? So, again, it, it's, 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 not intellectual, it's not intellectually good work for you to come out and not know what textualism is. So let me finish. You answered your, your question, right? You asked me a question. I'm answering your question. That's an ad hominem attack. Okay. That's what I find what most Muslims do when I know their Do you know what the First Amendment is? Yeah, freedom of speech. No, it isn't. The first, see, the thing is, look, if you're going to engage in, and I'm done religious, answering your questions. You're done. I'm religious done answering freedom. your questions. Right? If, an, if any individual, I'm a law professor, and what law, what, when you engage in a legal discussion, you have to know what basic things are. You have to know what textualism is. You have to know what the idea of a living constitution is. You have to know what progressivism is before you can engage in a logical conversation. That's a red herring. No, your reading of the Quran is a red herring. Be quiet. So... To finish off, this, this gentleman who would classify himself probably as a patriot only thinks that the First Amendment is, the, is freedom of speech. But in fact, it comprises four additional clauses, right? One of them, ironically enough, is the free exercise of religion, right? The right that individuals can practice whatever faith they deem fit. They deem fit. So I have a question. So I keep referring to a statistic that most Americans have never even met a Muslim person, yeah. like 60%. And I think that's probably what leads to the promotion of mythology. Uh, presidential candidate can actually say, uh, propose keeping Muslims out of the country, and we just stand by and mm -hmm. do nothing about it. And he actually puts it into effect. Um, 
There are, a lot of, there are a lot of resources in the Seattle area to learn about Islam. There are a lot of great speakers. Anyway, there's a place to find knowledge. And you can't just pick up a book and learn about it, but you can talk to people and meet people. And, and there's a lot of vibrant Muslim communities in the Seattle area. But my question about your book, do you, do you address the Islamophobia industry? Yeah. There's a lot of people making a lot of money promoting hate speech mythology about Islam. Yeah. So you do that in your book. I do, yeah, and I, I'm glad you bring that up because in addition to the state being led to, you know, spearheading these Islamophobic tropes and these, you know, misreadings of the Quran and the supplementary sources uh, that we just got a, you know, a simulated live uh, <laughs> sort of uh, display of, um, there is an industry, there is a private industry where uh, think tanks, lobby groups, corporations are effectively cultivating spokespeople, really prominent spokespeople um, to run around the country, demand considerable honor honorarium, and, if, and publish work that is feeding right-wing politicians to introduce legislation like the anti-Sharia ban, to legitimize um, you know, restrictive immigration policy, to justify surveillance policy, and so forth. So the industry, which effectively functions as subcontractors to the state in many respects, um, generate considerable revenue and then have considerable political influence. So I do talk about that in the book. Uh, there's also additional books, a great book by uh, a scholar named Nathan Lean called The Islamophobia Industry mm -hmm. that has an in-depth sort of analysis of how that industry functions. All right, thanks. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, so we've got one more question over here. Hi, how are Perhaps, you? sorry. Um, perhaps like a more positive end to this discussion. You Please. are a professor, yes? Yes. Um, you interact with a lot of the youth concerning the different ideas that you teach about. Uh, and as such, I wanted to ask, what's your opinion on the future of Islamophobia concerning America and mm -hmm. newer ideas and generations? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, good question. So this kind of seems like a cop out, but I, <laughs> I think I'm simultaneously uh, cautiously optimistic, but also concerned as well because I, I don't see Islamophobic policy being curtailed considerably because both the left and the right are wed to structural Islamophobic policy like counter-radicalization. Again, remember it was established by um, the, the Obama administration, which, which makes it really concerning again from a First Amendment standpoint, right? Because the cornerstone of American citizenship is the free exercise of religion. But for Muslims, the more they optimize their free exercise of religion, um, they actually maximize their prospect of becoming surveilled or perceived to be suspicious by the state. That is not an idea that is specifically coming from the right. So even though, let's say, hypothetically, Trump is beaten in a couple of years and we get, I don't know, Cory Booker, that's not an endorsement, but somebody like that, um, we'll see counter-radicalization being restored in the way it was under the Obama administration. So I'm pessimistic in that regard. Where I am optimistic is that, um, and I'm optimistic for reasons that we saw take place, incidents we saw take place in real time in the aftermath of the travel ban, right? I was in DC at the time, and I went to the Dulles airport, and I saw scores of Americans of all sorts, um, non-Muslims, standing aside Muslims, whites, blacks, Latino, Asian folk, right? Rushing to these airports to stand against what was happening with the travel ban roughly hours after it was enacted. So what that displays to me is that the fight against Islamophobia is no longer being you know, burdened or shouldered by Muslims alone. There's a pretty broad and I think growing, diverse and eclectic cross-section of people who are committed to dismantling Islamophobia. And I think that element um, is what makes me optimistic. Thank you. Thank you for your answer earlier to the gentleman and thank you for coming. Thank you. The remaking of Western nations in this so-called clash of civilizations that we've seen over the last uh, decade or so has occurred in a way that is very similar to what happened in the 19th century in Europe, which is the idea that the West is a beacon of enlightenment values, of liberalism, of all sorts of rights and so forth. And because those ideas and those values are allegedly not respected by people in these barbaric lands, there is a white man's burden to go off and colonize them and civilize them and all the rest of it. And of course, we don't use that kind of language today, 
Instead, um, you know, my colleague uh, Jasbir Poor has talked about homo nationalism, which is the idea that the American nation presents itself as a nation of tolerance because we have gay rights, because we have rights, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, as, as people know, recently granted gay marriage. But that didn't happen automatically. People had to fight for it for decades. I live close to Stonewall. If you haven't been to see the Stonewall Inn, there was a massive rebellion against the ways in which the police would routinely harass gay men and women back in the 1960s, back in the 1950s, and so on. They were forced into a closet, and by chance, they happened to meet at these places. They would be harassed, they would be beaten, they would be arrested, and so on. And so these rights, such as they are today, have been won by people struggling for them, by people organizing for them. The same is true for women's rights, right? It took, what, a century for women to actually win the right to vote in this country? And there was a great movie called Suffragette, which if you haven't seen, please go see it. It's about the struggle to win suffrage in Britain and how much these women were targeted. They were arrested, they were tortured in prison just for demanding the right to vote. So even though today it's just sort of taken for granted that we are these civilized people, we respect women, we respect gender equality, we respect rights for gays and lesbians and uh, the LGBTQ community in general, what's erased from all of it is that this is the product of struggle, right? And, it, and, and it's true that these struggles are also struggles that people are waging in Muslim-majority countries. We shouldn't paper over sexism and homophobia and transphobia that exists in Muslim-majority countries as well. That is to say, we can be against Islamophobia, but I don't think that we should be silent when we see injustices taking place in other parts of the world. And I think the key to actually winning all these rights and strengthening these rights is not accepting the clash of civilizations argument, but actually move, building movements from below, linking hands with our allies around the world and fighting for these rights to become true universal rights for everyone. So that's just a brief... Uh,